me is Chris Marr, from, who's a director of the George Institute for Global Health uh, and is a physiotherapist and uh, a leading physiotherapy researcher, and Amanda Mulcahy, who's a member of the APA, a physiotherapist, and also um, earns a living by working for the Australian Commission on Safety and Quality in Healthcare. Welcome to both. Good morning. We're at APA conference uh, in the, on the Gold Coast. Now, um, I let physiotherapists talk pretty lightly on uh, last week's Four Corners, um, I didn't talk about their contribution to waste in the system. Mark, Chris, how much waste would you reckon is contributed by physiotherapy techniques that don't work? It's very hard to get a good estimate on it, but I think all those issues that you covered across healthcare do apply to physiotherapy. So I think that's a really important point that we have a role to contribute to improvements in efficiency in healthcare, and there's a lot of things that we could change. Such as Amanda? Um, I think we've got some good evidence, um, particularly in some of the orthopaedic areas around um, around improving the appropriateness of care and, and physios um, putting the first hands on the treatment side of things but also the referral side. So when patients come to us we have a responsibility to make sure that the needs and preferences of them are streamed to, to the right place. So you're both, both being delightfully vague here. Let's get down to the specifics. The average private physiotherapist is filled with gizmos, things that sort of apply to your skin, that zap you, supposedly stimulate your muscles and do sort of things from which I'm aware there's not a shred of evidence. There is evidence, but it shows that it doesn't work. So I think the point you're making is a good one. Um, physiotherapy has to change, and I think one of the areas we could change is to move away from some of the electrotherapy, the gizmo modalities. Um, physiotherapy is now about 100 years old. I think that's probably contemporary practice in the 1970s. I think moving forward, you'll see less of that happening. What contribution does uh, the APA make to Choosing Wisely? You better explain what Choosing Wisely is, Amanda. Sure, so Choosing Wisely is a, um, a campaign that the Physiotherapy Association has recently jumped on board with. Um, it's been started in Australia um, earlier this year, it's um, been done in the US before, and it's all about patients making the right choices for them. So lists um, by different specialties are developed around um, the top five things that shouldn't be done. Um, so for example, in physiotherapy, things like using um, you know, your pins and needles machines, your TENS machines and things could be something that's on that list. So we're working with um, Choosing Wisely, which is um, done by the National Prescribing Service, Medicine Wise, and um, we're trying to develop a list at the moment with our members. Now one of the contentions made on the program was that FIFA service doesn't really work, particularly for people with complex problems, and that's an increasing area of work for physiotherapists, people with multiple diagnoses for which they're never going to get better and who are hard to deal with. And again, physios like GPs are paid for seeing somebody, not for making them better. Um, do you ever foresee a time where physios are paid for paid, making people better? I do, and I think there's a slight difference because GPs are paid by the federal government and in general physiotherapists are not, not so I think there are some different tensions there. But I, I agree, I would like to see physiotherapy evolve so it was funded under MBS and we could fund a package of care of physiotherapy that would reward best practice care and reward wellness at the end of that rather than fee for service. I think a lot of the profession would be quite comfortable with that. Amanda, do you think you agree? Absolutely. Um, we know that there is waste in the system, but it's difficult to measure because we don't actually have good evidence around patient reported outcome measures in particular. So um, we, we don't know what the right or wrong amount of some services are. So, so, so in the, for the purposes of this conversation, I'm holding physiotherapy to a higher standard than we hold the rest of the healthcare system. But if we were actually going to pay for outcomes, how would you imagine physiotherapists would engage in that data collection process and feedback? Is this through a registry system? What, what would it look like if in fact you had a feedback loop to individual physiotherapists about the effectiveness of their care? I think there's some already um, in the public hospital sector there are physiotherapists who contribute to registries but it's a team based approach so um, depending on the specialty area I think private practice is a completely different um, situation but when we're talking about team based care and it's a system level issue particularly in the public sector um, there are some examples of some registries out there um, that physiotherapists are a part of but we have a long way to go. Chris, if physiotherapists work to the full scope of their practice mm -hmm. what, would, what would the world start to look like? Well, I think the world would look like a much better place. I mean, if you think... Well, you have to say that if you're talking an APA I know, I have to. But, <laughs> I, but I truly believe there's lots of things that physiotherapists can do that are sort of constrained with at the moment. And I think healthcare would be much more efficient. You know, looking at the gatekeepers of the workers' compensation system is the, the GP, and arguably they're not the best person to be controlling management of musculoskeletal conditions because in their curriculum, there's a very small fraction of the medical curriculum devoted to musculoskeletal conditions, and so we put them as the gatekeeper. And I think that, that instills inefficiencies in the system. I think we need a greater role for the physiotherapist controlling the management of work-related injuries. Well, we've already seen that with um, 
knee replacement waiting lists and mm -hmm. hip replacement waiting lists in the public system, which have been a great success. Absolutely. Um, is there a future for the isolated physiotherapy private practice? There is. <laughs> it's a um, isolated is a word that maybe jumped us in. Um, a lot of them are. To, they're yeah, only to get referrals, yeah. but they're working as a specialist practice rather than perhaps integrated into a more comprehensive primary care network, mm -hmm. albeit in the private sector. You can be isolated geographically, but I think you can also be linked in, in terms of who you're working with. So, you know, some of them would look to be isolated, but they would work closely with the local pharmacist, the psychologist, the sports physicians. And so I think it would be quite unusual for a physiotherapist just to be working by themselves and, and their patients just being totally managed by the physiotherapist. That would be, I think, an unusual style of practice. So what's the role for the APA in this? I mean, it's hard for representative organisations to deliver for all their members if part of the memberships rebelling against this sort of conversation? Oh, I mean, the APA and advocacy has a lot of different arms. You know, I think the, the, the public system is, is one element where the advocacy has to come politically and it has to come through things like the MBS task force review and the primary care review. But then there's also sort of the individual onus on us as individual therapists to have responsibility to, to promote appropriate care and evidence-based choices. So. Thank you very much to both. Thank you. We look to this great new Yonder. Thank you. Thank you.